Another episode of The Superficial Spirit is here to save the lives of billions of people around the world with Jess and Derek, my Hi. two besties. Hi. We're, uh, how are you? we're really doing good work. <laughs> <laughs> Together, it's a movement. Um, I was going to say that last time my internet cut out and that was happening a lot. So we got an extension cord for the modem. I think that's what it is, the modem. So now mm -hmm. it's like halfway through the house and it doesn't have to go through the I, I think the internet waves were, were getting stuck in that fridge and cutting but, me out. Oh, do, well, okay. so you, they might have been, they might have been getting stuck in your uh, AirPods, which um, are mind control devices, actually, it turns out. Oh, I saw somebody, right. I, I saw somebody, this is, I saw somebody on Tinder and their profile was like, unvaxxed. Um, I, I, I want somebody who, like me, is unvaxxed on something on something vegan and doesn't wear airpods and i was like i can almost understand everything except the airpods <laughs> i guess he thinks like it's very tinfoil hat like he i guess he thinks you know that there's something going on there the five oh yeah something about it doesn't have a cell phone no 5g you know because the mind control from the 5g yeah i that's interesting and also it's always surprising when that's what people lead with you know, it's like you meet somebody and the first thing you're, that they want to share is that. Your pool is so, so, so narrow. <laughs> like you can't I mean, do anyone was, who does these 10 things, including where's their pot. Like, okay. I mean, I wasn't that specific, but when I was, you know, dating and on, on the apps, you know, and when I was like very much into new age, I really wanted to find a partner who, <laughs> you know, believed that we had past lives and, you know, like everything I believed in, because I was like, I have to like connect with someone and start a family with someone that has my same beliefs. And I'm sure everyone does that with, you know, if they're Christian or whatnot. Um, so yeah, not that specific, but almost there. Yeah. <laughs> like must believe in past lives, cannot be an atheist. Wait, did yeah. you did you um, blatantly just straight up ask or would you drop subtle hints that you were into new age and hope that they picked up, you know, um, the vibe? I might have just more so just like ask, like, what do you believe in? Yeah, mm -hmm. like right off the bat. Mm -hmm. Would you have been opposed to dating somebody who is spiritual, but not new age? Like maybe they were Christian, like not super religious, but you know, they believed in God, maybe Jesus and they prayed yeah. and they were, yeah. Okay. So yeah, just had to be like open to like, we have souls and stuff like that. Okay. Okay. Good, good. Um, actually when Evan and I met, I may have told you this, Jess, um, in our conversations, I was really into Doreen Virtue and Tarot and Crystals, all that. And when I went to Evan's place for the first time, he had um, Doreen Virtue cards everywhere and crystals all around his room. And I was like, this is a sign. It's a sign we're both spiritual. But that was really lucky actually, because we met each other right at the time when we were both really into it. Because I don't know how that would have come up in other situations about like manifesting tarot crystals. At the time in my group of friends, I was definitely like the only one. So I lucked out. I actually, <laughs> and, and like to say I had a similar experience, but the opposite where I went to buy protein powder the other day, cause I'm going to um, be Derek's body double. Um, and I love this for you. yeah. And um, by the way, thank you for answering my questions via text about everything protein. I, I am now only eating protein, like every two hours. Perfect. I did not know that was a thing because I was doing like two scoops of my shake plus a tofu salad. And I was like, oh my God, that's like 50 grams. But then that's not good because yeah, your body you probably, can't really do anything with it. And then you yeah. just, yeah. Yeah, your body um, won't really use any more than like 26 to 30 grams uh, yeah. for two hours. Yeah. So uh, when I was buying this anyway, it um, I was going to buy vegan protein powder and I've always bought vegan protein powder just because I felt better about myself. Honestly, I'm not a vegan. I eat mostly vegan during the day and Evan will make something neat at night, but like I have salads and stuff for my lunch. And for snacks, I have like almond butter and like, you know, crackers or something. Um, but he was like, why do you get um, vegan protein powder? And I'm like, I don't know. I just, it just feels good. And he convinced me to get whey, regular whey. He's like, you know, you're, it's better. It's for your body, blah, blah, blah. And then he, this is also the person who, when I got my third vaccine, which I did regret getting because it was a little overboard, he was not trying, he didn't say you don't need it, but he was like, you know, why are you getting your third one? And then I came in to get vegan protein powder. And he's like, why are you getting vegan? So it's like the opposite of what people normally like the um, virtue signaling. 
You know what I mean? Like, oh, I get vegan protein powder. You would think that in the sales situation, maybe they would lean more towards that instead of like, don't get vegan, get the fucking animal products. Don't get your third dose. You only need two. It was just like, he's super cool, but I found that surprising. Yeah, it is, that is unusual to hear someone advocate against vegan protein powder, but also against vaccination. Like you'd think, <laughs> you'd, think you'd be pro-vegan stuff and against vaccination as yeah. opposed to both. I will say for the record, there is I, I really no difference in protein powder where you get it from. I mean, I actually don't use whey protein, although I eat meat um, because I just... I just think it, you know, I don't, I don't drink milk, right? I don't, I don't really consume any dairy products except when I have cheese, which I have a lot of pizza, which is, you know, a problem for me, but, but I try not to have a lot of dairy and that's what whey is. So I just don't like, cause I think it makes me bloaty and farty. Like I just don't want that. So I use vegan protein. He said it's, 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 you don't get as much protein from the vegan. It may be more bioavailable or something. I don't believe that's true, though. I, I haven't seen anything to indicate that like whey protein is somehow more effective for absorption or anything like that. So great. I have a question. No, I'm... Why? <laughs> Why do you eat almond butter? Why do I eat it? Mm-hmm. Why do I eat almond butter? Well, I'll put it on toast or I'll put it on um, rice cakes, rice that's what well, called, I'm right? just, okay. So that's been just like a funny thing lately in the past year for me. I'm just like, why am I eating almond butter? It's gross. I'm not allergic to peanuts. <laughs> I'm going to go back to peanut butter. Like, I feel like I got brainwashed into like almond butter's healthier or something like that. And so, I'm like, why yeah. am I doing this? Like, and I just switch right back to like peanut butter without mm-hmm. sugar in it. I try like not to get anything with like added sugar, but I'm like, yeah, like I'm kind of like going back in my head of like, what was I brainwashed to, not brainwashed, but I don't know, listening to I mean, health gurus and stuff. Like I just was like, okay, I have to eat goji berries and almond butter and this and that. And Goji berries are nasty. They're like fucking little pebbles. They're so hard to chew. <laughs> nasty. Um, I remember I had a trainer like when I was tw- in my early twenties who basically gave me this diet and everything since then, when I'm doing like, uh, uh, when I'm trying to focus on fitness <clears throat> is based on that, like almond butter, protein shakes, rice, meat. Um, so I don't mind the taste of almond butter. I mean, I feel like peanut butter is good, but it's more like junk food. I think of peanut butter as junk food. And I think of almond butter as not junk food. That might mm. not be right, but that's how, that's why I, I don't mind the taste. So I don't think it's gross. Mm. I guess there's just some things where I'm like, wait, why am I eating this again? I don't even enjoy it just because like some, someone told it, me it was right. healthy, like not even particularly for my body. I'm like, again, switching back to peanut butter without sugar. Yeah, that's what I, I just do like natural peanut butter with no sugar added. Uh, and also there's like a ton of like vegetable oils and shit and like processed, like, like Skippy or whatever type of peanut butter. Right. Just so we're not misinforming people. I did just look it up. Um, whey protein can potentially be more complete protein in that it has like all, it's always complete. Whereas vegan protein may be missing some aminos, but studies haven't shown any difference in like muscle quality, muscle mass, muscle density, anything like that as a result of using one or the other. Okay. Well, and also what if you eat all of your um, protein in one meal, are you still going to get muscles? Yeah. I mean, yeah, it just, it depends on the composition of your meals. If you're eating weight, like too much protein, if you're eating 50 grams of protein in a really great salad and you're doing that a few times a day, like, yeah, you're wasting half that protein, but you're still going to, it's still, you're still going to get it. Yeah. It doesn't hurt you. And it's yeah. also like, what's the line? Because like you can, I feel like you could go fucking crazy with fucking diet and exercise, like calorie counting, protein counting, um, intermittent fasting, when to work out, when not to, when to eat, when not to splitting up the protein. It's like, what the fuck? <laughs> the At line- some point you just have to like, enjoy the process of being healthy, enjoy yes. the process of like putting together the diet and then just like live your life, go to the gym, eat what, not eat what you want, but have what I try and do is like write out the diet. So I know kind of what it is that I need to eat. And then I'll, I'll base my diet on that. Like I won't stray too far, but it doesn't need to be like exactly every time. Derek is frozen. Jess, are He's you frozen? frozen? I'm not, um, are you waiting for Derek? I've tried every, I feel like I've tried every diet pretty much when I was in my twenties. <laughs> um, and I think, uh, it's like taught me things. Like when I was majorly calorie counting a, like looking back, I do feel like it, um, was problematic. Um, but I also feel like now I've like learned things. So now I don't like 
count calories and count everything, but I in general know like an avocado is like X amount of calories. We'll just wait for Derek to get back. But no, um, in no, general, I just... feel like I've like, um, yeah, finish myself that. about yeah. food and well, calories and stuff without being like so strict. Like I need to count everything because that's no. almost like an eating disorder. Like I do feel like I got it... super skinny, but I've tried paleo vegan, totally raw vegan, which. Ooh, that is hard um, and impossible. Yeah. It's like little miss farts a lot. Like, yeah. Totally. <laughs> like, it is not good. <laughs> and for it's your so body. hard to get enough calories. Yeah. Right. Um, well, yeah, I was just eating like a ton of avocados. Um, so Derek's power went out. I don't know if it will come back oh, on. No. Okay. So maybe let's just keep talking. If he comes back on, great. And for anybody okay. who is desperately wanting to hear him, you can come back later. Um, <clears throat> I agree with you about the calorie counting. It's like a fine line between wanting to be healthy and being aware and then and then getting obsessive with it and mm-hmm. I try not to do that I just like I like the process of going to the gym and putting the diet together but I don't I do not put it in my phone every meal mm-hmm. I do not like weigh myself I don't even weigh myself like I just I don't track my workouts I just do my thing I try not to eat junk food like we yeah. don't eat fast food we don't like I do have dessert when we go out I'll get fucking cake or cookies and muffins but um yeah being aware but not being obsessive I think is the line for me yes and I'm just like Um, one of those you know now Californians that are like um is that dairy free gluten free and sugar free um so I find myself to be annoying but um that helps me from overeating and overeating dessert as well yeah, I mean, if it's dairy free, gluten free, sugar free, it's probably nasty. Hey, I make a lot of great desserts. <laughs> Are you a baker? Um, I do like to bake. I cannot cook, but usually, like looking up any paleo recipes that maybe use like honey, maybe some coconut sugar. Um, that's what I find like I like to eat, and I feel safest because if you look up paleo stuff, it is gluten free and dairy free. Yeah. Um, and usually still tastes good. Yeah, so Evan that's is. That's what I like to bake. Evan's pretty much paleo. I did make paleo gluten-free apple crisp a couple of weeks ago. It was mm. really good. I, I want to do a chocolate eat cake rice soon. and oats. So that's not paleo, okay. but um, that's also really good for baking with. Yeah. You do your own thing. Um, Hello. Oh. <laughs> back. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. How's the How's the sound quality? Uh, sounds good. a little different. A little mean. different, but we can hear you, which is the most it's important my- thing. <laughs> it's my AirPods, which can be like noisy. So yeah, I'm trying to find my corded um, headphone thingies for my iPhone. But meantime, I can participate probably. Okay, good. Okay. What happened? Well, I don't know. It's some. There was a big loud bang outside. <gasps> and then suddenly like half my apartment doesn't have any power, but the other half does. And I've been playing with the um, like the fuses and that's not working, so I don't know. What the hell? That's yeah. weird that it's half and half. Uh, and it's obviously the scary. half of my apartment that has the computer plugged into it, so it's Well, I hope it's okay. I hope it's not some kind of weird... Um... Actually, I'm not even going to say it. Hopefully, it will be okay. Well, I don't know why it coincided with that loud bang, right? That's troubling. Yeah, yeah, mm. exactly. That's what I mean. <sighs> We'll be okay. Anywho. Okay. Let me tell y'all something that happened. Um, I, Evan's dad came over. Evan is shooting a wedding today. <clears throat> Photographer. Photography. <laughs> oh my gosh. And Evan was like debating on if he should buy new shoes or not for the wedding. And then we found these boots and I'm like, you don't need to buy new boots. You have boots. They're black. They're nice. But Evan's dad um, came over like half an hour early to shine his boots for him. And in my mind, I didn't think anything about it. Evan's like, my dad's going to come over. He's going to shine my boots. And I'm like, great. I was like cleaning the kitchen. He came over. He went onto our porch and he started doing it. And I'm like watching him through the window. And he has this whole kit of like shining the boots, boot boot shining, like um, polishing. And I'm like, I have to go see this. Um, So I go sit down with him and he's telling me like, you know, when he was young, they would, the young, like the kids would 
basically get jobs learning how to shine boots for people. And it was a really big deal. Like back then, you had to have your boots looking nice. If how you were old professional, is it now? Uh, 70s, late 70s. All okay. right. So big deal. And he was like, you know, we talked about how when people traveled, they would get it before they went on the plane. Also, apparently they used to get haircuts in the plane, like before you would go places. And I was watching him do it. And it was like a 20 minute process, taking out everything, really looking at the boots. There's like a toothbrush, there's different polishes. He literally spit on the boot and he's like, spit and shine. I was like, okay. But I realized, and this is, I've been thinking a lot about mindfulness, about how why, why don't we do things like this now? Like when did people stop polishing their boots? I asked him, I'm like, cause people still buy expensive boots. Why don't they do these anymore? He's like, well, you know, people just buy new boots. Now there's just like a, they're, they have lower attention spans. It's more of a, when you're done with something, you just get rid of it and buy something new. Whereas before you really took care of things um tried to make them last you didn't just go buy f- fast fashion like if you think of h&m where you can buy an entire new wardrobe for 300 dollars, it's not made to last it's made to like be an instant gratification you wear it for a season and then you kind of but i thought how amazing that would be to like incorporate things like that into your life where it forces you to focus it forces you to take care of something because you are it's like a meditative practice and I'm watching him. He didn't think he was meditating. I don't think he would identify with that at all, but I feel like there is such a lack of things in our life that require significant concentration and care. Like if you think about your life from the minute you wake up until the minute you go to bed, everything is less than three seconds, you know, emails, phones, emails, phones, social media, cooking. Like, I don't know. It, it didn't make me wish I was part of that time when he grew up, but it made me, it validated my like thoughts about deleting social media from my phone because I feel like it's a distraction. Um, and I also wanted to put it to you guys to see like, is there anything you do in your life that requires significant converse, co- um, focused concentration for a significant amount of time that is direct rela- directly related to caring for something that you find valuable? So not focusing on work, not doing a workout, um, but like something that maybe you bought or maybe that you have inherited or that's around you that you like and spend time mindfully taking care of. Like that show Marie Kondo, is that her name? Where she's like, does it give you the spark of joy on Netflix? (laughs) That kind of thing. I don't know. It really struck me that, I don't know. After he left, I steamed my clothes basically for 45 minutes. I'm like, I love my clothes. I love this shirt, you know, and I'm like spending the time to do that. So is that something that you all do? Is there anything in your life that you I wouldn't say like anything like particularly like the shoe shining, but you mentioned steaming clothes. And so I do steam my clothes like after I take them out, even if they're just like raggy t-shirts, because, you know, I want them to be ready to wear. Um, and speaking of the shoe conversation, I do try to take care of my shoes where even with like, if there are shoes I loved, even if like, if it's a cheap Zara shoe, like I'll get them resold and stuff. Like I'll bring them into a shoemaker and have them fix them. Um, so I do try to take care of that. And I see that there is like so much value in that, like having a shoemaker if you can ever find one anymore, yeah. um, really take care of your items or, you know, making sure your leather jackets, if that's what you own, which I love my leather jacket, I'm not a vegan apparently, um, you know, taking care of the leather. So yes, like, oh, I feel like I am being overwhelmed with like this capitalistic consumerism we have where it's like everyone's starting their own jewelry line own clothing brand and there's just too much stuff out there and I just like basics and I do try to take care of my things so when you go shopping do you tend to buy more expensive items like a little black dress I'm just saying that because Spice Girls reference but like or like boots or leather jacket that's more expensive but would potentially last you years and years and years, as opposed to going to H&M, buying the $40 version and then buying one every season. We, are you comfortable spending a little bit more money and then taking care of it long-term? Um, on certain things like leather boots, my leather jacket, I'll spend more, but t-shirts and stuff, I still go to like Uniqlo and stuff like that. Um, I love certain Uniqlo. items. 
yeah it's like babe but it is fast fashion it's like this yeah. was made in 32 seconds and it's only 12 dollars. okay but it's fast fashion that's basics and I will wear the hell out of it because it's not like some purple printed in for only the next six months yeah. moment um yeah. print yeah how valuable is your time like when you think about how you give your attention to so many things throughout the day. Like what time I woke up at six today. I'll probably go to bed at like 10. That's a lot of hours in the day. What do you give your attention to? I know I'm bringing up social media again, but it's like, it's so valuable what you give your time and energy to, because we don't, we do have a finite amount of time on the planet. I know this is like a pretty big like concept. Like you only have so much time it's valuable, but seriously, what do you, Oh my God, I just got the funniest text. Um, how valuable is your time? Do you think about that when you're when you're scrolling or when you're mindlessly doing things throughout the day? Are you like, I need to come back to this moment. I need to like shift to things that matter. Is that a thought that you have, you both? Yeah, I mean, sometimes when I'm scrolling, I'm like, okay, wait, I should be either reading or like listening to a podcast at least or listening to an audio book. Um, so I'm not just scrolling or I get trapped in like I was talking about last time playing some of those games that I sometimes just have to delete is it candy crush no it's not <laughs> it's like a game okay. where like drop the numbers or something it's like a tetrisy block thing where it's like doing multiplication it sounds like a child's game but um <laughs> I'm learning math um Good for you, honey. I should get like some geographical games so I can like learn where Canada is um I'm kidding. <laughs> no, you're not. You are not. There's a lot of towns there, right? Yes, there are. Um, but yeah, I do have those moments where I stop and I'm like, let me like at least listen to an audiobook and you know, do something um, engaging. Clean my closet that... and stuff like that and do something active. Derek, do you have things in your life that you like consciously are mindful about taking care of and like, you know, make a point of having that moment with them? Well, of course, there's my cat. Um, and I used to have a lot of plants. And, you know, sort of watering them was, I suppose, somewhat meditative. Um, I guess I probably get that from cleaning as well, which is a bit of a longer term, like it takes you longer to do. And is, um, you know, a sort of self care activity, I guess. I don't, I definitely don't feel like any guilt about what I should be doing. Like, I don't feel any guilt about like, I should be enriching myself in this moment instead of playing video games. Um, you know, I, I think that is in its own way productive, right? For my relaxation. This is a, this is an interesting point. So could you spend all day playing video games and be like, yep, I spent the whole day playing video games and, and that's, and that's totally fine. Or do you have like a limit and you're like, okay, I've been playing for X amount of hours and it's time to do something else. No, I don't think there's any limit. I mean, I, you know, you said going to the gym, like doesn't count, but that is what I would It do. totally does count, I guess. But in the, in the context of like taking care of something, even though you are taking care of your body. So it totally does count, but I'm just trying to imagine in modern society, people caring for objects in a way that isn't like so disposable. I think we talked about this, um, the the idea that there's endless amount of romantic partners. So people start ghosting each other and they don't really care because it's this idea that there's an endless supply of everything. It's the same with objects, clothes, shoes, apartments. It's just sort of like, meh, I'll just get something better. I'll just get something better. I'll just get something better. So the idea of like taking care of something that you pay money for, um, was just on my mind this morning because when I looked at my life I'm like you know cleaning yes I like cleaning help I just get into a zone listen to podcasts um I love going to the gym baking sometimes I don't bake that often but I couldn't think of anything else that is like similar to shoe shining I just don't have a lot that requires any maintenance exactly that's what I mean. That's what his dad was saying is like we just don't have to do these things anymore everything is just fast consumed quickly you move on but is that it's, bad i don't know is it it's more convenient I don't, I don't think so i think there's other things we can do i don't think everyone is fulfilled certainly not spiritually fulfilled by menial meditative activity well it could be described as meditative activities like shining shoes 
Mm-hmm. Uh, what, what, why do I have to shine shoes? Why do I have to maintain an object any further than the occasional cleaning so that it stays functional and, you know, doesn't embarrass me when people come over and look at it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's like two different conversations. So it's like, yeah, is that bad? Like, it's great that we have more technology where we don't have to sit down and like shine a shoe forever, or we could just take it to someone. And the other half of the conversation is like, yes, I think it's bad that we have so much like disposable things and disposable um, fashion. Like we were just talking about furniture earlier. I totally regret getting our thousand dollar couch from Costco because it was super cheap but it lasted like six months because the fabric's like absolutely horrible I mean just coming apart and it's not the correct fabric to have um a cat like in the house like we should have gotten like a velvet so I do wish we spent more time and money getting um you know, better constructed couch that would last, not like removing the cats, even the fabric is just so bad that it's just like pilling as soon as you like move off of it. Um, so yeah, again, I, I feel like this is two different topics and yes, we should move away from like the fast fashion and like furniture and all of that. I think with Derek, um, what you were just saying about like, you know, is it so bad that everything can be convenient? Something like that. No, it's not. But I do think that technology slowly starts to chip away at like our purpose. Um, I'm watching The Expanse right now. It's a sci-fi show. And in it, nobody has jobs because technology has taken all the jobs. So if you want to get a job, you have there's like a waiting list of 3,000 people and it's a lottery and only one person every five years gets to be chosen to basically go to school and get a job. So if you think of in the future technology making everything so easy and so comfortable that we don't even have to work and we get universal basic income, it's like, okay, great. So now we don't have to do anything. Maybe we have self-driving cars. Maybe everything is delivered right to our home. We don't really have workers anymore, except for maybe a certain type of skill set. Where does the purpose come from then? Where do people get their meaning? And that's why I think there's value. If you look back before technology, it was so hard to get food, to make money, to keep your family, not maybe keep your family together, but like growing your food, being a farmer, keeping food on the table, staying healthy. There was not the same access to science and medicine. And so the whole purpose was like survival, right? You, you're just like, I just, it's like day to day. It forces you to be present versus super comfortable. You don't have to work for ever, anything and everything is just easy at your disposal. What does that do to human beings long-term? Well, I don't know that we need to like worry about the Wally, you know, slippery slope of will technology just result in us all being like having tiny little skeletons and just like 700 pounds of fat around our bodies and never even walking around. Like, I just don't, I think people will choose to walk. I think people will choose to do things that they find purpose in instead of scrambling to survive. I wouldn't say that work is our purpose in life. I would say that if we all end up having a universal basic income and like all of our survival Take, not all of it, maybe, but much of it taken care of, you know, universal basic income, guaranteed shelter, guaranteed food. I don't think this is a bad thing. I don't think it robs us of our purpose. I think it and technology enable us to pursue other purposes that we enjoy. Um, I, I certainly don't get my like fulfillment and purpose in life from work. I work so that I can, um, you know, do other things. <laughs> if you didn't have a job, what would you do for the 25 to 40 hours a week that you do your job? If you could like do anything in the world and money wasn't, you had shelter, you had your basic income, what would you fill your time with? Um, love my cat, play video games, travel a lot, meet more people, interact with more people. I'm definitely big on the travel one, just try to mm-hmm. have many more experiences, right? If I could, you know, pop over to an exotic location and just spend a few days like on a beach or in a villa or shopping or whatever, that's what I would be doing. And um, there are people who can do that, people who are fabulously wealthy, who um, don't seem to have a lot of complaints. I mean, certainly, yes, there are their like offspring who were born into like enormous wealth, who a lot of times do seem to be pretty like rudderless. But I mean, I guess that's- Rudderless, um, it's called- (laughs) But that's not, it's not a universal experience, right? Not everyone ends up just like totally despondent and lacking purpose because they don't need to work. So um, yeah, I don't know. I just don't don't see any reason to like 
I don't see any reason to like slippery slope, like cry about the Wally, -E, you know, future of technology taking everything away from us that we like to do. And also there are certain things like, for example, my job in writing, right, writing and communications, there are, there are actually some algorithms now that can start like writing communications material for you, but it's always a little off, right? It's always a little weird yeah. and bad. Will that gap be closed eventually? Maybe, probably, possibly not. Do I care to speculate on like the type of creative and interpersonal work that can be done by humans only to this point? Do I care to speculate on a future where that may or may not exist? Like, I don't see what that, I, like if that did happen, then we would all just do something else to find purpose, you know? I think that some people, for, the, for some people that would come naturally, people who have things that they're passionate about that are self-aware that can, find things to fill their time or are already aware of the things that they are passionate about. I also think that some people aren't and that with too much time on their hands, things could go crazy if they're not aware of what they like. And if they're, if they do have enough money to live and they do have shelter, but they have nothing else, I think that job can provide structure and not in the capitalistic way in the, this is what I do every day because it gives me structure because I need structure. Cause without it, I'm going to go spinny. Um, and I, yeah, I think we can take care of a bare minimum of survival needs for people potentially and still provide incentives. Right. Um, I think it's possible to, let's say, collect a universal basic income and have guaranteed food and shelter. Um, and then I, I don't you know, in what way does that eliminate um, the people who are, are interested in working for incentives to improve their life, buy more things, have more expensive shelter uh, have nicer food you know have the ability to travel these things but are you going to be able to travel for... on universal basic income if it's two thousand no. dollars a month no that's why i'm saying that's that's something you get to work for it's something that if you i don't it's right. not outside either, of what you're it's not either for. we don't take care of people socially at all or everyone gets to do everything it's we take care of people's basic survival needs and then incentivize them to do more to do other things yeah yeah. Which would hopefully be aligned with things that they care about and are passionate about, not necessarily being like a clog in the big machine to make billionaires even richer. Yeah, maybe. Is, I mean, I, we know that it's sorry. I was gonna say it's a it's 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 an interesting idea statement to say like the purpose of life isn't work because it kind of is in our modern society. There's we just the conversation about finding your dream job, about fulfilling your purpose, about doing work-life balance, about being um, engaged and having um, a positive experience in your career is just such a big part of how we know how to live. And I agree with you that it shouldn't be, but in like a capitalistic society, we're forced into this system. And I often wonder this because I actually do really like my job. I like what I do. I get a lot of satisfaction. And sometimes I, I, I pan out and I see the bigger picture and I'm like, am I, am I drinking some kind of Kool-Aid or am I like similar to like the sci-fi narrative of like people believe that they love something, but it's because they don't really understand the big picture. You know, like, would you really love your job if you really, really understood that it was making rich people richer and a lot of people were suffering for it and it was going to create automation that was taking away jobs, things like that? Like, can you have both thoughts of this at the same time? Can you like something and also see, oh, God, maybe this isn't maybe I'm being taken advantage of there? I think all of us, I mean, we, we literally are. I mean, it's we, we aren't we aren't working to earn uh, an equivalent to the um, to the value of our labor in capitalism, we just aren't. We're all being taken advantage. That's how that works. I mean, you can't uh, you can't uh, you you can't do capitalism without um, exploiting labor for more than uh, uh, for more value than or for less value than what it is worth uh, to to do that labor. Um, but it's also possible to understand that you have to participate in this system. Um, and while criticizing it and being dissatisfied and acknowledging that, no, I don't live to work, right? My purpose is not, yes, capitalism forces me to participate in this way. And I'm not even a huge, like, I'm not even like a huge anarchist, right? I, I really don't, I'm, I'm actually pretty like comfortable in my 
job. It, you know, it's fulfilling enough. I don't really mind participating in capitalism that much. It's not that bad for me, but it's really, really bad for some people. And I acknowledge that yeah. this is the ideal system in my mind would be completely different, right? It would be one in which people's survival needs were taken care of and yeah. in which, you know, labor wasn't exploited in quite as much, uh, you know, to quite the level, to quite the degree that it is and, and where uh, profit was shared amongst people according to their labor, of course, and all that stuff. So, so I don't, you know, it's, it's, it's possible to, to participate in something you think isn't very good, um, but also for that not to be your entire purpose, your purpose for living. I think it's possible to participate in the system and also live to live to travel or live to play video games yeah. like I do, you know? <laughs> yeah, 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 totally. Or whatever. It's a balance. Um, it kind of brings me into one of the topics that I wanted to bring up with you all. I don't know if you've heard of it. Um, what is it called? The lay, hang on. Uh, the lay down movement, <laughs> laying down movement. Have you heard of this? Lying no. flat. Okay. Are you ready? Yeah. Our friend, Dr. Paul, um, shared this with me. Um, so it's going to be over. good. Yeah, it's, it's good. Lying, the lying flat movement is a movement in China in which, um, workers are, um, protesting the intense pressure to succeed and be a part of the ambitions of the country by um, actively disengaging from work and literally lying flat and not going to work and not engaging in life and just being like, no, nope, I'm not doing anything. There's a big, I was reading a few articles this morning and China has a lot of ambitions to like, just be completely self-sufficient, not bring anything from outside the country, have a huge tech revolution and, and just sort of like be completely self-sustainable obviously requires a lot of manpower and talents and the pressures of people working nonstop 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 they're starting to rebel and lying flat and I'm like this is such a this is such an interesting and dramatic way to stand up against society and like the pressures that you know I think even more than we feel in North America they feel in China to like completely different extremes um, I wanted to put that to you both and see if you had heard of it and if not, what you think of it. I hadn't heard of it, but I think it's based. I love it. Um, but it is a pretty different work culture in China. I don't, you know, <laughs> I don't think they're quite as free to enjoy, um, what, what limited fruits of their labor as even we are in North America that, that there may be, right? No, very limited. Yeah, yes. I agree. Do you want to lie flat? Can you, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I have enough like uh, knowledge to speak like well about what's going on there, but um, I I feel like protesting works. So you know, hopefully they'll see some changes from what they're doing. Probably not. Uh, <laughs> but what I was just thinking about through the whole conversation before of like, what would you do? If like, if we all didn't have to work and now like, I want to check out that show, The Expanse that you mentioned. Um, it's long, it's like, like six seasons. I so. feel like I would play sports because there's some things I just don't do now anymore because I'm too exhausted from working. So in high school, I played volleyball. In my early twenties after work, I'd play volleyball. Um, and now I'm just like, I don't want to like drive 30 minutes to go play after work and, you know, and like sit in traffic. Like it was easier in New York because you didn't have a car. You can just like jump on a train and like walk a few blocks and like go to the gym and meet up with your team. Um, so if I, I feel like if I had more time, I would play sports and, and enjoy that and, you know, be a lot more active. In that it's regard. so, it's so like sad that the job that you do it, and you've invested so much time and energy in is like, I'm not going to go play sports because I'm too tired from like the shit that I have to do to survive. It's just so annoying. Like, yeah. I'm like, it's LA, California traffic. I'm like, I just know oh, like it's too stressful. Like I'm not going to be so stressed out, like driving somewhere and having to get somewhere. That's why I like kind of don't do anything anymore. It's stressful going to yoga class. Cause I'm like, there's no parking. There's, <laughs> you can't even get there in time. Then there, you can't fit in the class. So I've just like given oh up God. on some things because I'm like, wait, all this stuff is kind of like stressing me out, like getting yeah. to the thing. Um, so yeah, if none of us had to work, I would be doing enjoyable things like that. Or like, you know, this. 
learning more, going back to school or learning how to swim, maybe. You don't know how to swim? Um, I could swim for my life, I feel like. <gasps> like <laughs> That's if there was such like a, a dramatic thing. If me. I was dying, I could do it. <laughs> I could probably, yeah, do it. But. So you never had <laughs> swimming lessons when you were growing up? I tried to. I didn't like it. So I was like, oh. so I know some basics. I, I was, um, uh, I love being Derek alive. looks so I know. Funny. Derek, what are you doing? Sorry. He's I'm like squinting window. out the window, have, window with his mouth open. <laughs> I, I have an update. There's a fire truck in the alley now. So I'm certain something happened to the power. Mm. Can you show us the fire yeah, truck? Yeah, I can show you the fire truck. It's just a fire truck. Do they want to come on the show? Oh, I know that alley. I've been in that alley. Before. <laughs> yeah, I bet you do. Well, <laughs> and there was also a, I heard a bang and there's also a garbage truck. So I feel like a garbage truck knocked the fucking power out. Oh. I heard it hit something and then I lost power and now there's a fire truck. So, yeah. You know what? I'm not even going to edit you losing your power out because this is now a whole journey. <laughs> the listeners are gonna go well maybe edit out the long pause <laughs> yeah no that's a moment for the listeners to take a few deep breaths meditate be with us i'll sit there um, okay so I'm not distracting that, that whole topic of, of shoe shining and life purpose really didn't expect that to last this long but i'm glad it's you know yeah i i this is why i love talking with you both because it's a big question. What is the purpose of our lives and why do we have jobs and we're forced to like participate? Um, it's a big, it's a big contemplation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, let's like move I could, on. You know, and just, I, I could live the rest of my life, like working my cog in the machine capitalism job and be so comfortable and happy. Right. So this isn't coming from a place of me being like, overthrow this well it is I mean I do want to overthrow the system but like I'm not like I'll be fine but I think it doesn't work for most I people, know right? like, it's like I'll be fine Stockholm syndrome you fall in love with your ki kidnapper it's like I'll be fine <laughs> but like under well, but the... it's not that because you know I still I still think the fact that it doesn't work for most people is cruel right I think it's yeah it's it's a cruel system I know that but like but for you I'd, specifically I'd be fine. it's like yeah my life is okay yeah 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 yeah, you're not giving a choice. You're not given a choice, really. You're born. You're born where you're born to the family that you're born into, in the country that you're born into, and you participate. Mm -hmm. You're just like, yeah. Well, that's just it. Like so many people don't get a choice because of how how they're born, or you know, things they can't control, right? Yeah. Um, shifting gears a little bit. Um, there was a release from Disney this week, or was it last week? My favorite Disney movie, The Little Mermaid. I've been waiting for this trailer for a long time. Like they, I, I feel like ten years ago they started talking about that this was in the works. Maybe not that long. Uh, so I was really excited to see it. I liked it. I was like, doesn't look cheesy. I was, I was scared that the underwater thing was going to be like, how are they going to make it look good? But I mean, it's like a 30, 15 second or 30 second clip. It's not very long. You see Ariel like, well, you see like her tail through the ship. You see like a little bit of the hair. And then a very last second, you see her face and she sings part of your world, like a part of part of your world. Um, and I think to everyone's surprise, I didn't know this, that Ariel was going to be black. Oh, you didn't know that. I feel like maybe I heard it, but definitely when I watched the trailer, I was like, oh, okay. Didn't know that was, didn't know that. Didn't know that that was going to happen. Wasn't surprised. I thought she looked amazing. She sounded amazing. Her fucking fin looked amazing. It had like, it looked like it was made of silk. It was so cool. But um, obviously this caused a big reaction online. Did you each see it? Um, I saw the clip and yeah, it looks really good. I'm actually like excited to watch it. It looks like it's going to be beautiful. And I've seen like some stuff on Instagram where people are just like posting memes about like what Karens are probably saying about it. Um, <laughs> and yeah, I don't know. I don't have much to say all the other than I'm excited to see it and it looks beautiful. Derek, your turn. Yeah, I hope. I hope, I hope, I hope that it's good. Um, it, Little Mermaid, it turns out, is my favorite, like, 
classic Disney animation. I didn't sort of realize that until recently, but like, and my concern is, is Ursula actually, like, I don't know about Melissa McCarthy pulling this off. Should have been divine. Because I think the original performance, Pat Carroll's performance is, I think the best vocal performance, both the song and the uh, dialogue performance in any Disney movie. I think it's the best vocal performance in any Disney movie. It's, I, I, I like get goosebumps when I think about it. And I don't know if Melissa McCarthy is up to that. Um, but, but that said, like, you know, I saw the TikToks of all the like, there's like TikToks of little black children, like watching the trailer and being so happy and like crying and stuff. And like their families are so happy and everything. And I think that's like awesome. I love that. But I kind of think black Ariel is bad <laughs> and people are going to hear this and without proper context, they're going to say, that's because you're a reactionary and you think go woke, go broke and you're a Karen and you're a racist, but that's because they are dumb and I am smart. And I'll explain why. <laughs> <laughs> so oh, at, like, Lordy. Here we go. Um, so it's actually kind of, it's a little bit problematic the way Disney does this, right? They have a history with these remakes of trying to correct, like they're sort of not very progressive old properties. You know, they slotted, you know, they looked at LeFou and they said, like, LeFou's probably kind of gay. They teased this gay character being in Beauty and the Who Beast. Who is LeFou? And then what was it? LeFou is, is the sidekick, the lackey to Gaston. Ah, and at it. the end of the movie, he, there's oh, he's a gay character and they get all of this like attention, positive media attention for being more progressive. And then what is it? At the very end of the movie, LeFou just like dances with a man in drag. And you're like, okay, I guess that's the gay characterization they were hyping up. You know, in Beauty and the Beast, Belle, now she's an inventor. She's not just a hot lady that things happen to. Now she's the one who actually makes the inventions and her dad is a bumbling idiot, right? So uh, the Disney, te- oh, Mulan is awful, right? The Mulan one is awful because instead of being someone who like bucks tradition and uses her guile and her, you know, ingenuity to get through like this situation, she becomes magic, right? The circumstances of her special birth become the reason why Mulan is special, not her smarts, right? Not her ingenuity, um, not her bravery, and not her willingness to go against tradition, right? And so these are like these cringy, aesthetic, meaningless changes that Disney keeps making to the movie in order to like get attention from, positive attention from aggressives, negative attention from reactionaries, which just gives them like more marketing power, right? And this is, I feel the same thing with Ariel. Well, why is that? Okay, it's, I'm not mad that Ariel is black. I think, I do think that it's really great that those little children are seeing something that makes them so happy. And it's not totally without impact to just see something in media that represents you. There is a positive outcome to that in some ways, but there's also a concept called crossover in critical race theory, which is why I'm smarter than people who are gonna say this is a racist take because none of them have engaged with critical race theory and I have, um, where in a show, like in a media property, a character is just happens to, to have a diverse identity, but that is never explored in the text of the show. Their identity never makes an impact on their characterization. Literally anyone could be playing that part. It just so happens to be a, a minority. So let's say in this case, a black person. So for example, you might have a law show where a black woman is a lawyer, right? But throughout the course of that show, that character could be played by a white man and it would make no difference because her blackness is never part of her characterization. And I can already hear people saying, well, that's kind of racist of you to think that every black person has to be a certain way. People can just be black and it's not a big deal. Isn't that good? And kind of, but it's not without complications because there is a daily reality to being a minority, to being a black woman. Ask any black woman. Are they going to say, I never feel like a black woman? I highly doubt it, right? They're going to have certain important experiences in their life, probably on an almost daily basis that, that are the ones that only they can have. And so if that is never depicted in the show, we call this crossover. And it's a way of signaling and doing an aesthetic change that you never have to account for, right? So I feel that what's happening with Ariel is Disney gets to palette swap Ariel, right? From white to black and make, now, you know, you can say, well, why would mermaids have to have the same black experience as people on land? To which I would say, well, she's gonna meet people on land in that movie. And if none of them act like there's, 
and if none of them act like she's black, right? Mm, right Seems right, like they right. could. So why are we making this change without there being some artistic impact, some artistic follow-up to that, right? And the reason why, I'll tell you why, it's very obvious, is because the, ex- same, the same executives in Disney making this intentional decision for marketing purposes have the exact same attitude as the reactionaries saying, go woke, go broke. It's so cringe that they've made Ariel black. Their attitude is exactly the same. They're just, they're not doing it for progressive reasons. They're not doing it out of artistic, anything artistic that changes the actual story. They're literally doing it cynically to make money and get attention, right? So the conservatives are right when they make that criticism. And I just want to add also people, a lot of, and I'm sorry, I'm talking long, but it, a lot of this like requires groundwork that most people don't want to think about when they hear this stuff and react to it with a knee-jerk reaction. Um, th- there are no decisions in culture and in art in creating cultural products that exist in a vacuum, right? Harry Styles is not just expressing himself. These are decisions he's making with a team of executives, with PR people who are saying, what's the impact of this? Is it good or bad? Is this good for your image? There's no, but people, there's no casting director just, just choosing the best actress to play Ariel. These are decisions that go all the way up the chain to the highest level of corporate executives that are made by committee, right? They don't exist in a vacuum. Everything that exists is a reference to something else. It's totally anti-intellectual to say, well, maybe it was just, they're expressing themselves. Maybe it was just a casting director. It's never that, right? There's always intentionality behind what you produce culturally. I'm hoping this is them fixing the problem. Do you hear that noise? <laughs> just a little bit really fucking loud i can barely hear it okay well anyway so that's kind of the end of my spiel right this is an intentional decision there's a lot of people who want to say maybe she was just the best actress no she was probably the best and most beautiful black actress that they could find but they chose a black actress very intentionally right yeah oh obviously that yes it was Disney. They didn't do anything by mistake. And even seeing the trailer for the first time, it was not surprising. I mean, we're seeing this more and more in culture where, like, as you call it, palette swapping. Um, traditionally white or historically white characters are now Black or other ethnicities. One argument that I've seen online is, like, it's not a real world. It's a fantasy place where mermaids exist. So, to your point of, like, if they're going to make a character Black, then they need to incorporate the Black experience into what the character is living. So, if Ariel is Black and she goes on to land and everybody's white, what is that experience going to give that character? But if she goes on to land and everyone's like, oh my gosh, this beautiful mermaid is now a princess and nobody mentions it, then is that diminishing and completely completely erasing what would happen in real life in the world that we live in but since it's a mermaid and it isn't real is there an argument for well racism doesn't exist in ariel's world well kind of sort of that's my point though my point is that it's not necessarily like a bad thing but that the effect of it does effectively say all the black all that being black is is a skin color it basically erases the idea that being black is more than that, which it is, it's a lot more than that. I think black people would mostly tell you that there's a lot of pride and a lot of pain involved in that experience and what Disney is communicated. So it's not about what's in the text for me. In, inside the text of the movie, it's perfectly fine for no one to have a historical experience of blackness on land or under the sea. Um, but externally, Disney is doing something by communicating in this way. And what they're doing is basically saying black is only a skin color. And while that sounds progressive, it sounds good to say, you know, it's, it's very, I don't see color. It's very, we're all the same underneath. It's just, it, it, it is erasing of whatever pride and pain is associated with that experience, right? So my, that's my question. My question is, well, why are we making that palette swap without doing anything interesting with the art about it? Well, and the reason why I've already explained is because you get lots of attention from progressives and you get almost more attention from reactionaries. It's it's such an interesting thing that happens because if you consider the fact that this is a billion dollar company that's been around forever and ever and ever that has only made white focused stories for so long um, and the process that goes into making any type of content that gets released through Disney, it's um, I can't even imagine how many hours, how many meetings, how many actors, how many incarnations of the script, how many budget assessments that have to happen for something to finally be seen by the public. So when you watch it, some people have a positive reaction, some people have a negative reaction, but possibly a lot of those people who are reaction aren't thinking 
past just what they're seeing. They're like, well, like what you're saying, Derek, what I'm hearing is why, 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 why is this happening? What, what is behind the decision to make Ariel black? There's the little kids who are having a positive experience because they're seeing representation. I can say that. Oh my God. When I saw Troye Sivan, the fucking twink pop stars like this, I feel like I'm watching myself. It was really great. Really validating. Um, same reason why I loved white blonde pop stars because I was growing up and I was white and I was blonde and I, I saw myself in them. So it's good to just see it. But then when you question the corporation and the money and the power behind it, is it coming from a place of, we want inclusivity. We want little kids, little black kids to feel like they see themselves in our princesses and in our mermaids. Or is it just for clickbait and to get attention? And can it be both? Do you think there's people in the Disney boardroom who are like, no, we need to start thinking about inclusivity and we need to start making some of these characters black. And maybe they, those people are challenging. Like maybe we can adjust the storyline a little bit. Maybe we can, you know, if we're going to present diversity to the kids, can we also present the black story in a way that educates them on what it means to be black in America? at the same time. Right. That's like, what I was thinking. I just kind of want to wait and see because we're assuming Disney's just color swapping. I well, have based on glimmer based of on hope Mulan that... and Beauty and the Beast <laughs> and Lion King and uh, whatever the fuck else I mentioned, that's what we're assuming based on, right? We have a history of all of these remakes doing that at this point. How old is Mulan? It's older. Only a couple of years. I don't know. I can say. Mulan. Mulan, maybe the original gosh, cartoon so. I feel like it was anyway no, I'm trying to hope that you know maybe they change the story in 2020 line and continue this after um we've seen the movie I think we'll, we'll see yeah, absolutely <laughs> yeah, we'll see we'll definitely see but I mean I would just say like we <laughs> the executives making these decisions at Disney are like 90,000 year old white dudes like they're 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 reactionary they're polishing they're their shoes this. and if they were doing it out of a desire to do something progressive then they would be telling progressive stories and they're not they're just slotting right. in they would yes they would be making brand yeah. new stories for the audience that they're trying to engage do you think that we'll ever see two princes or two princesses in a like mainstream disney movie i do just you um i think it might take a while we might see them like, like as side characters at first yeah. Like the next door neighbor is two princes. <laughs> right. The you know castle down I mean? the street. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Their best friends are two princes. Um, I think it might be, I don't know. I feel like it might be a while still. Um, to see like the main characters from Disney to some of Derek's points. Yeah, <laughs> or yeah. he doesn't think well, they I'm... probably didn't change the storyline at all for Little Mermaid. So yeah. Yeah, I mean, I just want to emphasize you know that the move i'm not I, I, i'm not mad that ariel is black right i just want to point out that that you know peter you're kind of asking can these two things be true can it be true that like it has a positive impact on you know it makes little black girls happy and there is some value in, in just seeing that on screen as a lead role yeah there's value in that absolutely um um movie something like I was a little upset about sorry moving away from Little Mermaid is when they did Soul like a year ago because is that basically teaching kids that there's reincarnation you have yeah. souls and there's reincarnation we don't know that that's true and now of course Disney movies teach kids a lot of things like um you know they get a boyfriend or girlfriend and they're a princess or not um but Soul especially in like Dang, they're like tapping into like spirituality and now telling kids that we have souls and there's a reincarnation and what the purpose of life is but we can to be continued on yeah, that if I, you guys haven't seen no, that. I rem I, rem I have seen it and I thought it was a I remember watching it being like damn this is deep this is for adults this is like really really yeah. you know the meaning of life what happens when you die how do you have a meaningful life that kind of thing which I think is a great, um, what's, what am I trying to say? It's a really nice idea to make content like that for kids. And then you just have to, I guess it's like, this is coming from the same company that did Toy Story where toys talk and mermaids. And there's a lot of things in Disney that aren't real, but the general message 
I think is is supposed to be wholesome, like live a good life, be a good person, believe in love, rise up against evil, that kind of thing, which, you know, never happens in the real world. But that's what I took from soul. I, I wonder, and I think we'll find out once that generation grows up, if they're like, you know, I saw soul and just, I just always felt like there was reincarnation because of that movie, just the same way you know, people who grew up on Disney assume everything works out in the end and that everybody falls in love. Everybody finds their prince charming. If there's a beast in your life, you will overcome him or he will just turn into a handsome man. Right. And, or marry him. <laughs> or marry him. <laughs> so we'll see. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Um, this is, all of the topics are kind of like piggybacking on the other one because just to like wrap things up, do you all know who Trisha Paytas is? The YouTube star? Yeah. She just had a baby and named it. Dun, 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 dun. No, Malibu Barbie. Oh my God. First name Malibu, middle name Barbie. YouTube star Trisha Paytas welcomes first daughter Malibu Barbie. Hmm. That's the future, ladies and gentlemen. YouTube stars with babies named after dolls at least she can go by mal at school right i love it i mean the name malibu is cool i wouldn't i would 100 name a kid that malibu barbie yeah well malibu is cool but yeah not so we yeah, started Malibu was kind of cool but malibu barbie oh god <laughs> does that project any it. like i is also that kid gonna grow up feeling like they have to like i mean look, there's you know, videos like, of their mom on youtube doing the craziest fucking shit in the world so i think their name will probably be the least of their concerns when they're able to understand who their mother is not that what she does is problematic but i mean parents kids are generally horrified about what their parents do on like a on on a like quote-unquote regular life and so if you have a britney spears Trisha Paytas, who's like made a career first, she was like the famous fast talker. And then she's eaten like, you know, like five large pizzas. She sings off key. She got it. She's hilarious. She's like a really, really funny content creator. But yeah, I mean, it is 100% believable that she, I also have this theory that um, celebrities release these over the top names, but they're not the real names. Like she says to the media, the name is Malibu Barbie, but her real name is Rebecca. So that when she goes to school, nobody knows. And it's sort of like this celebrity conspiracy will tell the media something over the top so that the kids can choose to have a private life. Maybe. You know? Could be. Um, we'll see. Trisha we'll see. is not, I mean, she's also been like really problematic pretty recently as well. What does she do? This, like, well, at one point she claimed to be trans and that seems to not have been true. She seems to have taken that back, I think. Oh, she said she was she, a gay man, think, right? She said, she, well, yeah, and I, I don't know. And and they may, all, they may also go by they. I sometimes see them being referred oh. to as they by like news sources, okay. which fine. Like, I'm not going to say that's not right. But it seems like it seems like they weren't really trans. And they've also like done some really weird fetishizing of like Jewish people because her husband is Jewish. And she said some really like weird shit about trying to convert to Judaism, but then like making kind of a joke and a mockery of the whole idea, which is very offensive to like most people, you know, who are, who are Jewish. Yeah. And like, yeah, it's, she's been, she like, she like admitted to like paying her way to fast track her conversion to Judaism. She like said something about, oh, I just paid, paid them and they like bought me up a level or whatever, which is like, really well, problematic when it comes to stereotypes about jewish people you know like i will say i have heard that in my private life evan's well, and jewish. Evan's jewish yeah so I yeah will, so i have I heard I won't argue like, with that but i have heard the process can be long or short depending on who you are who you know and how much money you have um but yeah crazy um and i see her pronouns based on all of these um headlines are her Okay. That's far. Yeah, as I, I mean, know. so I think she might have she might have taken it back, right? So she's the same kind of trans as Demi Lovato. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. Oh my god, these celebrities. Um we started last week reading um reviews. So I have one for today. And anybody who's listening, please, I might start doing this at the beginning of the show. I just drew all over my hand during the whole episode. Um 
Uh, if you listen to the show and you like it, leave reviews, send us messages. We'll read them on the show. I know you both five star suggested, reviews. yeah, five-star reviews, <laughs> but honestly, whatever, five-star reviews. This one happens to be a five-star review. All of my reviews are five-star though. So, um, this is from JBBBY. Um, fame and spirituality. I'm in. The title is such a great explanation of what you're about to listen to. Taking what most people think as frivolous ideas or pop culture moments and connecting it to human experience. Peter is thoughtful and an intelligent interviewer. Yay. True. That was really Love nice. It. Saying shit like that is how I got on the show permanently. <laughs> <laughs> totally yeah day one praising peter like praising peter that's going to be my new podcast <laughs> praising peter breeze <laughs> i'm listening to a podcast right now called the sunshine place which is about a cult um oh jess you had some culty some culty info um yes well i started watching the new netflix show um sins of my mother um something very culty um crime and I think it's still going on like it just kind of happened in like 2020 and the people are still like their court dates are in 2023 so it's very recent um definitely recommend watching it um they don't do a good job of explaining what these two people actually believe in other than pegging people as either dark or light spirits and if they're a dark spirit they basically get rid of them including children Um, wait what do you mean kill them yes (gasps) so it's kind of crazy to watch but I still have like questions like I want to know I'm a little confused after watching it like between this man and this woman uh Lori Vallow um and this man she met and then married who kind of swept who in to their beliefs? Like who how many was episodes the is that? there? Um, I only think it's three. And okay. again, I still have more questions of like, what were their actual beliefs other than just yeah. like some people are like dark or light. Um, I'm hoping someone gets into that. I thought it was day. Mormon. I thought they were Mormon. Um, I think she started off as Mormon, but something mm. went even more like new age. That's agey. how it always starts. But um, so yeah, I still have like questions around that, but it's so interesting and so crazy. And again, like just recent. Um, so definitely watch that. And then something that caught my eye today was on Instagram. I follow Vox and they had a post that said, want to be happy, don't trust your gut, right? So that kind of like caught my attention because in my past, especially like being new age spiritually, um, I was always trying to find like, okay, what exactly, how do I know if it's my intuition talking to me, if it's my quote gut talking to me? So they interviewed, I guess some scientist dude, I like jumped on, started listening to the pod, but it was also, um, it was also, talking about like what makes people happy. And I, as soon as I start listening to it, I'm like, no, like this is just some like, you know what sometimes you think like these places like Vox or maybe even Vice sometimes and like just some of these, I don't know, maybe like half posts, like fluffier um, media companies, they just kind of put out, like they need to start like putting out content. So they're just putting mm-hmm. out whatever. So it's like this data dude that was, like from Google that looked into a lot of data and analytics and stuff. And he's putting this all together. I'm like, it just kind of sounds like BS and they need it like a fluff story where I'm like, I'm really interested in this topic, but then the science behind it, I'm like, no, like I still want to trust my gut. And when he got to the part on the pod saying, you know, what data shows makes people happy. The number one thing was sex. And I'm like, come Uh, on. I'm pretty sure the number one thing is being in a secure relationship where then the sex is good because you're in a happy secure relationship not it's sex and the second thing is going to museums and in the top five <gasps> is karaoke and I'm like I freaking what? hate karaoke going like what it like and I just shut off the pod because I'm like this is just BS it's Ooh. so stupid and you're just putting out fluff information um so we can put it in the show notes I can send it to you guys so you can try to take a listen but 
I'm it was like right to. before we jumped on today again I was super interested because I'm like yeah always like how can I tell if something's my intuition or my gut and how right it is because again being in that new age spiritual world you can't just think any of your ideas or things that are in your head are correct like my spirit guy told me xyz so I was like again super interested in what the science says your intuition or inner monologue really is because I do think it's a mix of things in our subconscious and things we've learned through life that maybe we yeah. forgot about. And that's why we feel weird about something or flinch at something. Cause we remember, you know, getting, you know, in a car accident, we were two or something like that. So it's such a mix of things, but I guess my point is, I don't know, like sometimes these things are just putting out, um, fluff and to use yeah. your gut and know that <laughs> it's probably <laughs> like still not the best information. Well, there's your mistake. And, <laughs> right. And then reading the comments, a lot of people were like, uh, F no. And like, I don't know, I'll send it to you all. We can put it in the show notes. Um, I pulled up the post on Instagram. It says, um, your gut instinct is usually wrong. At least that's what economist and former Google data scientist, Seth Stevens, David Dowitz argues in his new book, don't trust your gut. He argues that our gut is wrong because our intuitions are influenced by false impressions of dubious conventional wisdom. <laughs> Sounds about it's right. It's just so clear that like the stuff they pulled out for that article, it's so like, it's so like, it's so dependent on what the methodology of that study was like, obviously, like those are such right. weird conclusions that if you don't look at the methodology, you're just like, what the fuck is the, what's the use of this? If I don't know what questions they were asking, how the surveys were conducted and on whom, like, right. Well, yeah, people were saying in the comments, like you can pull out anything you want from data. Yes. And who are they interviewing? Like sex is the yeah, number one the thing that makes everybody and, happy. Yeah. That was my eye roll deep into my sockets of the morning. Uh, I don't think I'm going to listen, honestly, but thank you for sharing it. And oh my God, Jessica's comment is right up at the top. Can I read your comment too? Mm, (laughs) I started to listen to this pod app and nope. I roll number one thing that makes us happy is having sex. Really? That's the key to human happiness. And number two is going to the museums. (laughs) Please. That's me. Yes. I loved it. And then you find out, you read the methodology and you find out they like went to a Facebook page of museum enthusiasts and you're like, okay. (laughs) Oh my God. I'm sorry. I hate karaoke. Worst thing ever. All right, y'all. It's been a slice. Derek, good luck with your power. Jess, don't trust your gut. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. And I will talk to y'all next week. Okay, bye.